The universe is a strange place. In our last video on whether the universe is locally real or not, turns out it's not, a lot of comments in the comment section predominantly focused on three main questions. How do we know the speed of light is the same in all directions? Thank you Veritasium, I blame you for those questions. More interestingly maybe, how do we know that information can't travel faster than light and what would happen if this wasn't true? Finally, we'll talk about Sabine's most recent video where she says that we can actually travel faster than the speed of light, which is of course wrong, unless it isn't. These are important questions, but before we can tackle them, we need to decide what reality really is, because it turns out nobody can really agree. Light has been the subject of investigation since natural philosophy began. You'll have heard of it before as both a particle and a wave, but it's a weird sort of wave that unlike sound or water or any other wave that we're familiar with, doesn't need a medium to move through. And that was really confusing to physicists for a very long time. They thought that there must be something called an ether, back when physics words felt like they came out of fantasy novels, that was the medium light moved through. Because the Earth and the solar system were moving relative to this ether, it was believed that light must have different speeds in some directions than others. Because the Earth is essentially catching up to propagating light in some directions and moving away from light in other directions. Not enough credit goes to this in stories, but what actually allowed Einstein to do his famous work was first Michelson and Morley proving that this wasn't the case. They built the first interferometer, a design we now use to detect things like gravitational waves, with two arms that point at 90 degrees to each other in different directions, that split and then recombine a beam of light. Where the light recombines, it creates an interference pattern. The idea was if the light was moving in some directions faster than other, as they rotated this device, that interference pattern should shift as light became delayed or accelerated in one of the two arms. Very long story short, like many good experiments in physics, nothing happened. Light, it turns out, was constant in every single direction that you measured it, even if you were, say, moving at 390 kilometers per second, which the Earth is relative to the observable universe. The speed of light you would measure isn't 390 kilometers per second plus the speed of light in some directions, it's just always the speed of light which feels weirdly counterintuitive. Like most teenagers, light doesn't care about math. It just wants to do its thing. But this evidence gave Einstein the most revolutionary ideas he ever came up with. When he was just starting to think about space and time, Einstein proposed a thought experiment. It was actually this experiment that first captured my imagination about physics as a 12 year old skinny English guy growing up in America that needed another reason to be bullied. A big part of understanding this is what reality actually looks like as you attempt to go faster than the speed of light is getting your head around the fact that reality doesn't look the same for everyone, which feels strangely counterintuitive. Imagine you are traveling on a train and another person is observing you from outside the train. To the outside observer, you and the train are moving at some speed we'll call V. But to you, the outside observer is moving at a speed minus V in the opposite direction. Suddenly, two bolts of lightning hit the front of the train and the rear of the train at exactly the same time. Except everyone you tell about this experience disagrees with you. The person observing from outside the train says actually what happened is that the rear of the train got hit first, then the front of the train. The reason it looked like it happened at the same time to you is because in the time it took for light from the rear of the train to reach you, the train had moved forward a little bit. So there was a bit of extra distance to cover compared to the bolts that hit the front of the train that had slightly less distance to cover. So to you, it looked like they arrived at the same time. But that's not right, you say. The observer only thinks that happened because they were moving at minus V in the opposite direction. Actually, the rear was closer to them and the front further away, making it seem to them like one arrived before the other. Now the paradox here is that you're both right. Reality, the order of events, isn't the same for everyone, particularly if those events don't happen in exactly the same space at exactly the same time. If they're ever separated by some distance, then people can't agree on which happened first. 
But that's just light moving at the speed of light. Einstein found that it becomes even more counterintuitive when you try and move close to the speed of light. But what's not counterintuitive is making sensible investments. And that's why I'm excited today to team up with our sponsor, Masterworks, where you can access shared ownership of beautiful works of contemporary art in minutes without needing millions of dollars. And these aren't NFTs or cryptos, these are Picassos, Monets, and Bristol hometown hero, Banksy's. Masterworks breaks paintings into shares after registering them with the SEC. If Masterworks sells a painting you're invested in for a profit, you get a share of that payout. Last year, they paid out over $25 million to their investors. So far, every single Masterworks exit to date has returned a profit to investors. With nearly 700,000 users, Masterworks offerings have sold out in minutes before. But remember, all investing is risky, so do your homework before investing and only invest money that you can afford to lose. Thanks to Masterworks for sponsoring this channel. Now, back to the video. Let's imagine you're standing on Earth watching someone fly by on a spaceship, and this spaceship is traveling very close to the speed of light. The individual traveling in the spaceship has a pulse of light bouncing between two mirrors and uses it as a clock to keep time. Because the speed of light is constant, we know this clock will keep very accurate time for the spaceship. However, to the observer on Earth, they see a much longer path that light must take to bounce across the two mirrors. Again, because the speed of light is constant, this must correspond to the time inside the spaceship ticking slower. This is a phenomena called time dilation. A nice way to visualize this is to think about it on a space-time diagram or Minkowski diagram. The speed you move through space-time is constant. Let's represent it by the length of this line. If you're sitting still, all of your speed through space-time is traveling in the time direction. But if you start to move, then some of the speed that you are moving through time starts to become speed through space. So relative to people that aren't moving, you'll see the passage of your time and their time starting to disagree. The fastest I can communicate with the other places in space is the speed of light, represented by a 45 degree path from me to a point in space. Sending some messages back and forth between two stationary observers looks like a slightly boring game of Pong. This model is enough to help us understand how broken the universe becomes if things start moving faster than the speed of light, and reality stops making sense entirely. Up until this point, everything, though a little weird, has been good about being consistent to the observer. The speed of light always looks the same, the clock you are holding always looks like it's ticking at the same rate, the order of events might differ depending on the speed someone is moving relative to you, but they have a way of explaining that and so do you. Cause and effect, like light, is locally consistent. But back to our Minkowski diagram. Let's see what happens if we start to allow things to move faster than the speed of light. Let's try and plot what sending an instantaneous signal to a ship traveling at some large percentage close to the speed of light would look like on the Minkowski diagram. My world line sitting still is still a straight line in the Y axis, and a ship moving close to the speed of light has an angle approaching 45 degrees, but never quite there. If at some point I communicated instantaneously with this ship, this works for any speed faster than light, it's just easier to draw instantaneous communication, this would be represented by a horizontal line in the diagram connecting these two world lines. Keep in mind though, we said the faster you are traveling in space, the slower you are traveling in time. So on the ship, relatively, less time has passed than on Earth. Looking at the diagram from the ship's point of view, where they observe themselves to be at rest, an instantaneous transmission of information now looks like a communication back in time. If they were to then send an instantaneous message back to you on Earth, it would look like the answer arrived before you even sent the original message, or the information could travel back in time. If you want to take this to a weird extreme, which physicists often like to do, this means you could know everything there is to know about everything, because if you plan to ask it at any point in the future to a distant traveler, the answer could have already arrived back to you. All information humanity ever learns could have been back propagated 
through time to someone with these instantaneous communication devices. Cause and effect would be completely broken as the outcomes of actions could arrive before the actions were actually taken. These closed time loops are a real problem and for now we don't really have a good way out of them. But could we one day? Sabina did a video recently proposing that in fact, going faster than the speed of light may very well be possible. The points she brings to bear essentially boil down to number one, at some point in the universe's history, just after the Big Bang and before the Higgs field condensed, particles didn't in theory have mass, so could in theory move faster than the speed of light. Except as she points out, most mass is in binding energy and this still counts as mass. So any interesting complex particles, protons, neutrons, anything made of quarks with binding energy would still be limited to subluminal speeds, but maybe we can do away with that at some point in the future. Point number two though she brings up, because we know general relativity isn't a perfect theory because it doesn't contain quantum effects, so hey, why not throw in there the possibility for faster than light travel also because all bets are off so let's jam as much stuff in there as we want to. This kind of feels to me like a bit of a cop-out answer. That is, other than the fact that there's direct evidence that this might be true. If we look at the behavior of even mass containing particles, even at the atomic level, not just the subatomic level, if they ever come up against a barrier that they cannot pass due to something like the exclusion principle or some other repulsive force, there is a finite chance that they can suddenly pop out on the other side of the barrier, having at no point in time remained within the excluded area. This is called quantum tunneling and it's how Santa gets into your house if you don't have a chimney. In 1962, a semiconductor engineer called Thomas Hartman discovered that the time taken to tunnel for a particle can be largely independent of the thickness of that barrier. Meaning that given a barrier thick enough, particles could seemingly vanish and reappear on the other side of that barrier faster than light could have traveled given the same distance through a vacuum. This hints at the idea that superluminal travel is actually possible and is called the Hartman effect. So faster than light travel is possible, but as far as we know, causality breaking faster than light travel is not. But what's the distinction? The quantum tunneling event is a random event and when it happens or doesn't happen can't really be coerced by us. So it doesn't take with it any information. As it doesn't take any information with it, you couldn't as a result see its arrival and send any information back. Causality is still luckily or frustratingly, I don't really know which side I'm rooting for at this point, preserved for the moment. Nevertheless, it is a very interesting idea and a stark reminder that quantum mechanics and special relativity don't always get along. There is still more to discover and explore. If you like this video, feel free to leave a like, subscribe. If you're looking for more on paradoxes, I'd recommend a video we did earlier on retro causality, but technically what is the past, what is the present? Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you on the next one. Goodbye.